Hello, everyone, and welcome to this TELIT webinar, How IoT Enablement Enhances Security and Surveillance for Smart Buildings. I'm Amanda Flink, the Head of Global Events here at TELIT, and I will be moderating our event today. Um, first, let's jump right in and get to know our speakers. Um, to explain this topic today, I'm pleased to be joined by two speakers. First, we have Mike Frazier, the VP of Sales for the West Region at TELIT. Hi, Mike. Thanks for, thanks for joining us today. Hi, Amanda. Happy to be here. Thank you. And second, we've got Jennifer Doctor, Senior Director of Product Management at Johnson Controls. Jennifer, thanks for joining. Oh, thank you for asking. It's a pleasure to join this audience today. Just before I hand it over to Mike um, to start our presentation, I do have a few quick reminders for our audience. Um, I would like to encourage you to interact by posting questions. We will have time to answer some of those at the end of our presentation here. Um, simply submit a question by posting in the box to the right of the slides. Also, please be sure to check out the resources section in the upper right-hand corner of your screen for some additional information on our topic. And finally, we will send out the replay link um, to all attendees at the conclusion of our webinar. Um, and with that, Mike, I will hand it over to you to kick us off. Great, thanks, Amanda. So to start off, I'll basically uh, just talk a little bit uh, at a high level about IoT uh, in general, and then a little bit about a, you know the market we're talking about here today, security, how Telet fits into the picture, uh, and then we'll hand it over to uh, to Jennifer to tie, to tie dive into uh, Johnson Controls. Um, so if we look at the big picture, uh, the IoT is obviously a, a very broad market. Uh, we're talking, you know, tens of billions of devices being connected, uh, and just wanted to set the stage that uh, Telet is a big player in in this market. We uh, we, we enable companies uh, in the IoT, and with the number of devices we're shipping, we're we're connecting a new device almost every second. And again, just you know, high level view uh, where we fit in is we're we're a provider of uh, wireless modules across a number of different uh, technologies. We offer connectivity services. And then, of course, we have uh, our software and platforms that tie that together in terms of the application and then device management of uh, uh, devices once they're out uh, in the field. So if we, if we look at the, uh, the smart home or smart building uh, market as a whole, um, you know the the security aspect is is a is a piece of that market that we've been involved with for a number of years. Uh, both Telet and JCI are, are leaders in that space. Um, and then over the years, it's it's really evolved to uh, to incorporate a number of other aspects. So uh, you know, outside of the the security systems in in homes and buildings, we're seeing uh, applications for utilities management. Um, you know, whether it's uh, controlling the thermostat in your home or a complex HVAC system in a building, uh, entertainment, uh, you know, we've all got uh, connected devices in our, in our homes uh, on the entertainment side. Health and wellness is a growing area as well. Uh, and then even appliances now. So whether you've got a connected refrigerator, or coffee maker, or whatever the case may be, uh, there's lots of growing, uh, growing markets in that space. And, and often this uh, security Piece becomes sort of a hub to uh, uh, to oversee a lot of this, uh, this connectivity within the the building or the home. Some of the the market dynamics that we're seeing, um, you know, in terms of Industry 4.0, that the trend is really accelerating. Uh, you know, in terms of the adoption of IoT uh, and also edge computing, uh, so mach machine learning, AI, things like this. We'll, I'm sure we'll be hearing a little bit more of. An, in the presentation as well. Um, we've also seen COVID-19 through the, the pandemic has really uh, increased the need in a lot of areas. So we've had, uh, you know, buildings that were empty for, uh, for extended periods of time. So that ability to remotely be able to control and manage and, and secure these facilities becomes uh, increasingly important. Uh, and then, of course, organizations are really looking to, to automate and, and be more efficient in, in how they, uh, they control their facilities as well. So 
so then if we we dive a little further into the the security market specifically um you know there there's growth there as well so i think the the trend is that uh, you know iot is growing the the smart uh, building or smart home market is growing uh, and specifically the security piece as well so if if we look at uh, you know the the 30 million plus uh, actively monitored alarms in the uh, U.S. and Canada, uh, and another 16 plus in in Europe. Um, and you can look uh, on the data here as far as uh, how the things have projected. There's continued growth in in all areas, um, and, and we see the you know security services and these enterprise systems being the sort of the largest percentage of that uh, that share. This this chart brings a, again a little bit of a broader scope on on IoT in general for smart buildings. So then we're uh, we're talking about a lot of the other uh, devices, uh, small sensors and uh, other wireless technologies being incorporated. So it's a much larger view. Uh, but again, that that same trend holds true that uh, there's continued uh, significant growth over the next number of years. So I think that represents a a big opportunity for us all. In terms of benefits on, uh, you know, the IoT within this uh, smart building and, and home automation type of space, you know, again, there's there's the security space, which, um, you know, we're familiar with and, you know, whether it's uh, alarm panels or cameras or uh, any peripherals tied into that, uh, you know, we're also seeing a lot of, a lot of focus on uh, the HVAC and, and lighting, as we mentioned. Um, even through the the pandemic as well, uh, you know, monitoring uh, uh, the occupancy rates within buildings, uh, social distancing aspects. There's a lot of factors that uh, became more important through that, um, and uh, you know, again, the the thermal controls and uh, hygiene and cleaning, maintenance within buildings. These are all things that can be uh, uh, monitored and, and controlled remotely, and, and we can add some of these edge computing technologies here as well. Some of the other trends and shifts that we see um, is really the, you know, increased need for these uh, remote uh, management of, of you know, the energy side of things is very critical. We, we want to be more efficient and, and reduce uh, costs for buildings, so there, there's lots of potential there. Uh, the occupancy rates, as I mentioned, uh, especially during the pandemic, uh, and, and also using that data to, you know, if people leave a, a room, being able to uh, have the automation there to, to turn down the lights and, and lower temperatures when, when spaces aren't in use. So uh, all, all data points that are, uh, are increasingly uh, used. Um, the, the, sur the surveillance piece, of course, uh, and supporting emergency services. So uh, things like the uh, the first net network uh, in the U.S. Uh, for public safety, uh, we have products that support those specific bands uh, as that's being incorporated, um, and then private networks as well. You know, we see uh, an increased trend there, where uh, large campuses or, or large facilities are, are opting to deploy a, a private network and, and may have requirements to have specific private bands along with the traditional. Uh, public M and O bands. So again, we have we have products that support uh, those types of deployments as well. Um, and then wearables. It's becoming uh, you know increasingly uh, more popular, uh, both from a sort of health and wellness side of things, uh, but and also uh, track and trace uh, applications as as people are monitoring uh, folks in in the buildings or in facilities and uh, and using that data uh, to their advantage as well. So I guess when we when we dive in specifically more in in the cellular technology, um, this is where we see a, a bit of a divide in the market. So there's um, there's really the sort of the higher end, what we call our high category uh, LTE and 5G products, where uh, increased uh, throughput and, and speeds are required. So uh, you know if we think of the case of you know streaming high definition video from a camera as part of a security application. Um, that's one end of the the spectrum in terms of the products, uh, and then on the other side, 
you know, whether it's a, you know, an alarm panel or, or even further, uh, a very low cost uh, sensor uh, that might be battery powered. And so, you know, very different requirements from a cellular standpoint, very low, low throughput speeds required, uh, very low current consumption required uh, and, and size as well. So um, we, we've really got this, you know, market that splits into to two aspects. So we have mods that support the the LPWA technologies like CADM1 and NBIOT to address the, the smaller uh, requirements at the lower end there. And then we have, you know, a full portfolio of uh, data cards uh, and uh, high CAD LTE and 5G products to, uh, to support the other end as well. And in terms of cellular for, uh, from a security standpoint, you know, I think cellular has a, a lot of security built in inherently. Uh, there's the 3GPP specification that the products are uh, designed towards. And, um, you know, that involves a lot of uh, security credentials. There's unique uh, identities that are injected into the devices at the time of manufacturing. Uh, we use secure boot uh, so that all firmware is signed and uh, there's a secure root of trust so th there cannot be a situation where, uh, you know, an unsigned firmware is, is loaded onto a module um, and, and all of the, the necessary security hooks for the, the major cloud platforms as well. So there, there's a lot of uh, security at the, at the module or device level that, that helps uh, this overall uh, space as well. One other point I want to make is the, you know, from a from a wireless technology standpoint, it, it really is a, a hybrid approach. There's not one wireless technology that is a one size fit all for, um, you know, for this market. It really is a combination of, you know, cellular uh, in a lot of aspects, but then, you know, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, other short range technologies as well, uh, often used in the buildings with some of the sensors. Um, and then we, we do have some, you know, positioning uh, GPS and, and timing uh, modules on a standalone basis that are that are often used as well. So it, it really is a, a mix of a number of different technologies uh, and, and we do have uh, offerings in each of these categories to, to help uh, based on the, the needs of the application. So final slide for me, um, just again wanted to back up and look at the sort of the bigger picture um, really, our goal is is to to try and simplify uh, IoT is a is a can be a very complex uh, space to enter. Uh, a lot of uh, you know whether it's the device level or the connectivity or you know managing your deployment once it's out in the field. There's a, a lot of uh, aspects that uh, can become very complex, especially as your deployment grows into you know thousands or hundreds of thousands of devices out in the field. Um, so that's where we've really tried to, to simplify things and, and help customers get to market faster. Uh, so whether it's our, our devices themselves uh, on the left-hand side of the, of the chart here, uh, and as we move across to the, you know, the connectivity services that I mentioned, uh, so we can, we can help uh, aggregate a number of uh, carrier uh, services into to one single uh, pane of glass to manage those globally. Uh, and then the the application and uh, device management uh, platform as well to uh, to really be able to manage that uh, deployment once it's in the field, push firmware upgrades over the air, uh, all all these things that become very important uh, as your uh, deployment uh, matures over time. So uh, we try to build this all into a, a full solution for customers. Uh, in the IoT space and, and certainly from the, the smart building and, and security uh, standpoint, these are all uh, important factors. Um, so that's it for me. So I'll, I'll hand it off to, uh, to Jennifer and, and tell us all about uh, Johnson Controls. Thanks, Mike. Uh, and thanks again for the opportunity to join you today. Um, I'm just gonna take a couple of minutes up front and talk a little about you know, who is Johnson Controls? Um, Johnson Controls is a company with more than 135 years of history. Um, we have a global team of 100 or 120,000 uh, experts across 
um, you know, more than 150 countries. Our products are in close to 200 countries. And at the core, Johnson as a business is about transforming the environment where people live, work, learn, play. We're look, you know, Johnson's mission is around helping to build and develop smart and healthy and sustainable buildings and spaces that reimagine how these buildings and spaces serve people, places, and the planet. Our commitment to sustainability is very strong. In fact, our head of global sustainability was literally just uh, selected as the number one leading woman uh, globally in the efforts of sustainability. Our CEO sits on a number of councils, including several uh, formed by President Biden here in the United States, um, as well as some others. But when I look at Johnson, I bring it down to my business unit, which is part of the security team. Johnson has uh, 12 different product business units. Security is one of them. In that business, for the alarms for what we call intrusion, um, we've grown through a variety of brands. So some people in the market know us as BSC. Some know us as Qualsys. In Europe, people know us as Visonic, as Bentel. We have one of those proprietary RF communications that Mike was talking about requiring the lower connectivity, and it's called Power G. It's a frequency hopping 128 AES encrypted fed spread spectrum RF that is our proprietary RF and embedded in um, more than 50 of our products um, to provide an additional level of security and uh, transmission protocol. And all of these, we go to market as one Johnson control. In our security market, we are the leader. We own a 27% market share in the uh, Americas, and we own 17% market share globally. And again, globally, um, we're talking close to 200 countries. Our competitors are the names that you may have heard about in the, you know, through other relationships. We compete with Residio, we compete with DMP, we compete with Honeywell, we compete with Risco, with Nortec, which owns 2GIG. Um, we compete with Jablotron. We compete with, um, you know, Vanderbilt Technologies, Texacom. The list is endless. In our market space, our global space, we're looking at revenues of 4.1 billion for the security space. And the CAGR over the next several years, the growth rates, we're really looking at nine, almost 10, um, you know, percent in terms of our growth. So we have an extremely large growth opportunity as we continue to build. You would think that COVID would have changed how people view security. And actually, the last two years of COVID, with people staying in their residences and trying to maintain their businesses, has actually increased our, the demand for secure and solid uh, devices and protection of spaces and places. So, as difficult as there have been challenges around uh, the supply chain, which we all feel, um, you know, in micro components, we're actually understanding the increased demand coming from our market. So what do we do in our market? 
our market is for residential and commercial solutions. We offer wireless and hybrid, which is a combination of our wireless and our wired in different vertical um, markets from residential to small business, mid-size, and we do have some enterprise. We've been doing this for years. We have award-winning products, um, and we have a long list of our of wonderful partners, including Tellit, um, and I'll get into some of the platform partners on a future slide. So what we see in trends is that connected products continue to increase. As I said, you would think that COVID would have actually caused a decline, and it's showing a difference. It's showing almost the exact opposite. Now, one of the items that we see um, is the definition of connected items. And 10 years ago, people were talking about devices and IoT in relation to their routers, their computers, their laptops, their smart TVs. And now what you see is that connectivity has to go into new categories. You know, Mike referenced um, smart appliances. I moved into a new home two weeks ago. Um, my landlord had replaced all of my kitchen appliances. And the first thing I noticed when I looked at these appliances, every one of them has a QR code on the appliance. Now, I haven't taken the time to actually scan them and start using them that way. Um, I'm more concerned about cardboard boxes but I've got a full kitchen of smart appliances and I'm really looking forward to seeing what that's going to be, you know, enable for me. Um, I'm really excited about making sure I can, that I turned off my oven after I've left my house. Now we look at that in a connected home and say, okay, that's cute, but that's driving adoption of some of the core devices. These core devices what we call um, what drives the adoption and security. And it typically starts with locks, lights, and thermostats. And you can see that in this chart, you'll see that the percentage of the US households who are owning more than three devices has increased by 64%. And that's pretty phenomenal when you think about how technology is consistently adopting and evolving, with any consumer adoption, um, you have people that jump on the bandwagon early and often, and you have people that are, you know, taking their time and checking. But what we're seeing is that these connected devices are becoming very integrated into the home, and that's leading to more connected devices, more sensors are coming in the home, and we're seeing an increase in our demand on a residential side. Now, when we look at the commercial side, what we see is businesses which have tr traditionally been a little bit slower in adopting um, technology that the you would see in the business are now changing their operating models to meet the needs of the customers. And the commercial business are heavily investing in their energy, air quality, particulate, organics, water, but integration with the building automation systems, integration with property management systems are all becoming very required. And the driver for this is that the business owners and the business managers at larger operations understand the conveniences that they're receiving in their homes, and they want the same in their commercial business. Now, this is also being pushed for by enterprises who want to take on greater control of their IoT through understanding uh, how 
enterprises are going to change these models. And this shift to cellular connectivity is really repositioning the experience that users are having to the edge. So some of these changes include eSIMs and the year of the eSIM and the greater interoperability is one of the monikers that was put in 2022. eSIMs are going to start to become a default technology for IoT, breaking the move of a 40 year plus lock between operators and SIMs that are in individual devices. That's gonna offer more uh, choices Choices are the driver of a lot of change. Um, the business operators, the business owners, managers, they're looking for alternatives that are going to help them manage their business. In residential, we look for ways to lower costs. In commercial, we're looking for ways that are going to help manage businesses. We're also seeing more on edge devices um, moving to the edge to have greater control of their deployments is something that the business owners are looking. And as Mike pointed out, the evolution of 5G is gonna enable enterprises to take more control of their networks at a larger scale and drive forward. So, what does this mean in terms of our trends? What do we see with the devices and the sensors that we're developing and installing in both, you know, the smart home for the residential and the smart home, smart building for the commercial? Um, analytics, analytics, analytics. I remember saying eight years ago, he who owns the data wins. You see this in your homes. You see Apple, Google, Netflix, Amazon. Everyone wants to own your data. The more data they own, the more powerful the companies are, the platforms are. So the need to provide data, have the sensors provide the data, pass through data to provide business intelligence which is gonna influence our artificial intelligence and machine learning continues to grow at an exponential level. We see a trend that involves more around sounds and audio, analytics, listening, not in terms of I wanna know the conversation, but in terms of understanding the environment. Are there differences in noise levels, which could indicate challenges. Um, imagine if you're a landlord and you own multiple units in a, an apartment building and you keep getting a noise complaint from a resident in apartment 2A about the party happening in 3A. And you have the ability to collect sound analytics and understand the reason that 3A is, you know, walking around at 2.30 in the morning is because you hear baby crying or 3A is constantly having a party, which is breaking the rule. Now you have some data. And again, it's not about saying that you know, I'm listening into what Mike and Amanda are saying in a conversation, but the analytics tell me this is a normal event or not a normal event. Voice continues to be a trend, the ability to speak to our smart devices and have them respond how we'd like. The occupancy detection, the, the idea of following me, um, that when you're in a home, you're, it's seamless. You're not going device to device. It just flows. In a building, your occupancy, your presence is known, and where you are and where you should or shouldn't be is controlled by your presence. Um, unified presence, we're all tired of having 19 remotes to work 
the DVR, the smart TV, the Apple TV, the Chromecast, the, you know, Hulu. Um, it's the same in our, in our security market. Having unified devices so that if you buy a camera from Amazon and you want to put it into a security panel through a Z-Wave integration or a Wi-Fi integration, you don't need 96 different devices to control. Um, finally, the predictive behavior. That predictive behavior is what's going to help drive us into the future into understanding that at night I turn off my lights and then there's a gap and then I turn down my thermostat or I turn up my thermostat, eventually that behavior becomes learned and the sensors need to be smart enough and communicate well enough to understand and respond. So what do we see um, in terms of use cases, I talked about some of these. Mike has mentioned them. We see a lot of use cases for smart sensors and well-connected sensors in residential, in energy, in the multi-dwelling, in personal wellness, in building management. I, interactive services are those platforms that allow you to interact remotely with your system. I've got an app for that. Those platforms are critical for the connectivity between the core hub or what is functioning as the hub, whether it's a device or in the cloud, and our sensors. And the use cases extend across all verticals. I mentioned four here, education, retail, small business, medical. I can keep going for hours just thinking about where the verticals are. And so can you. If you think about, well, I went to a, the library and they have a special collections. Here we go. Um, we talk about uh, NBIOT, cellular communication over a narrow band, and devices that can communicate via cellular. Well, okay. Put it in a, um, and don't do this because we are, put it in a smoke detector that goes out at a forest ranger station. Imagine being able to look in advance and have early warning of dangers where there are no people because your devices can communicate. Uh, finally, my last, nope, that's not my last slide. That was my last slide. So I'm going to pass this back to Amanda and let her close this out and manage this the way she intends. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, great information, guys. Um, really, really appreciate it. Um, audience, before we get to the questions, I am going to drop um, a poll on your screen. Um, if you'd like to have one of our experts contact you, please uh, just respond here on the poll and we'll get someone to reach out to you directly. Um, we do have time for a few questions now. Um, we still have time uh, to ask a question, so please submit using the box to the right of the slides here. Um, we will choose a handful to cover now. Um, we'll do our best to cover as many as we can, um, and those that we don't get to today, we'll be sure to follow up with you. Um, so I'm just going to dive right in here, um, and Mike, this is probably a question for you. The first one I see, um, how will the new 5G networks impact the use of cellular technologies in the security market? Okay, yeah, great question. Uh, certainly lots of, uh, lots of hype and activity in the market around 5G, uh, and there, there are certain aspects of, of the security market today that can benefit from 5G. Uh, most of the initial products in, on the 5G networks today are targeted towards really high throughput, uh, high bandwidth type applications. So uh, as we kind of mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, streaming high resolution video, you know, multiple streams of 8K video, things like that, that might be used in certain uh, uh, security applications would be would be an area. Um, there's a, advantages in, in the 5G networks in terms of latency as well. So things where we need really quick uh, responses, um, you know, that can be an advantage as well. Uh, but certainly for the, the bulk of the market, 
um, you know, LTE and some of the, the LPWA technologies we mentioned, like CAT-M and, and uh, narrowband, uh, really offer those lower cost um, products that can, can facilitate a lot of the applications. Um, as we look forward in 5G and some of the future 3GB, 3GPP releases, like release 17, release 18, that's where we see, um, you know, some of these uh, uh, future technologies that will uh, replace that lower end of the, the cellular uh, requirements. Um, so there's uh, reduced capability or red cap. You'll hear that uh, that term used uh, with release 17. Uh, and that's where we will see uh, some chipsets and, and ultimately modules targeted towards that uh, lower end moving forward. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, next question I see, Jen, this one might be for you. Um, what is the biggest challenge in device adoption? I think the biggest challenge that we have in a device adoption is cost. Um, as a consumer of the technology, as a consumer of the components, um, we understand that all of our component costs continue to rise from our vendors, from our partners, um, but the market doesn't accept the cost increase. Um, and it continues to challenge in how do we invest, how do we develop lower cost devices, which we have a challenge with better technology that costs more. And it's a constant conflict that we need to manage internally and with the help of our partners. And it doesn't matter what cost point you're talking at. We have the same problem on a $7 detector as we do on a $500 line card for a monitoring receiver. Great, thank you. Um, next question I've got, um, and I don't know if you guys both want to sort of take a swing at this one, um, but do you see global differences in the commercial or residential markets with the growth of IoT sensors and devices? I'll take I'll take the first start at it, Mike, and you'll probably be able to build. Um, we see differences in global markets, not with the desires in what they want, um, but in the speed of the market adopting the new solution. So residentially, we see a pattern of what region is typically the first to adopt, followed by what area, followed by what region, followed by what. Um, and we, at, with our experience, we see the pattern. With commercial, it's different. The pattern is not the same as residential. There are different technologies available <clears throat> um, that drive the need to change the path that we would take for a residential. Uh, for example, we may have a product that we're putting out in North America, but the Nordics are actually advanced in commercial um, technology. They're not the first to market in their residential, but they are among the leaders in their commercial buildings and spaces. So, we need to look at how we go to market um, in terms of the path and the product. There are some differences beyond just a, a radio protocol. There are differences in features and regulations. Um, and it's much more prevalent with our commercial than our residential. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, I think from our standpoint on, on the module level, um, certainly, we do see some differences in uh, features that are requested. So there, there is certainly a range, and 
you know, as as Jennifer mentioned earlier, costs come come into that as as a big uh, driver. So, uh, you know, that's where we really want to have a broad portfolio of uh, things from very low cost uh, NBIOT type products that are in a very small and energy efficient uh, uh, package um, up through these you know larger, more full featured products for for some of these more commercial uh, applications that might have more demanding requirements and. Uh, and from the global standpoint, I mean, we we, we certainly see a, a trend towards, you know, not having multiple, uh, you know, regional versions of, of products and, and standardizing more on one global uh, module that can be deployed anywhere in the world. So uh, a lot of our newer products are, are coming with that uh, that intent in mind and, and uh, simplifies things for uh, for our partners to be able to have one design and, and deploy that globally versus having to manage uh, multiple different SKUs. Thank you both. Um, and Mike, this I think is a good follow-up question to sort of your, your last statement there. Um, how could Telet simplify um, the complexities involved with managing a large global deployment across many countries and carrier networks? Yeah, so there's there's a lot in that one. Uh, so on the on the device or module standpoint, there, there's the global uh, global products as I mentioned. Uh, if you look at it uh, from the carrier standpoint, in terms of connectivity services, uh, that's an area where we act as a, an aggregator and, and can funnel uh, companies' requirements across multiple carriers globally into one one managed uh, service through Telet. So there's a there's a lot we can offer there. Uh, Jennifer brought up eSIM uh, as a technology as well, so that's a, a very uh, fast uh, advancing technology that we we have products uh, that support that, and it's enabling a lot of new use cases as well. Um, and then from the device management uh, platform standpoint, so being able to once you have you know hundreds of thousands of devices out in the field, and and there's been some carrier network settings that need to be changed and, and now you need to you know push an update uh, of new firmware to to all your devices uh, you know having a platform that already supports that functionality and be able to just quickly uh, push an update to the field is uh, is becoming more and more of a, a requirement and so that that device management uh, platform we offered helps tie that together as well um, and and lastly the uh, from a from a hardware footprint standpoint, we have a we keep most of our products in a, in a very common uh, footprint. So it's is one board design, and then you can swap out multiple technologies on that same footprint. Uh, so we try to keep uh, keep things uh, simplified for for our customers from that standpoint as well. Great, thank you. Um, I think this is a, a good stopping point for us. Um, it's about all the time we have got for today. Um, so just going to remind our audience um, to check your inboxes in the coming days. We will send out the replay link um, and a few additional resources um, for you to look through. Um, thanks, Mike and Jennifer, for your time today and uh, appreciate all who joined us. Thank you.